A blessing to uh, be with you today here in Ohio once again, flying back to frigid Minnesota. Actually, it's been pretty mild here the last couple of days, almost the same as here, but going back tomorrow morning, and uh, then next week to Montana, then after that, Florida. And I'll be glad to take a break after that. <laughs> but uh, I don't do this full time, but it, it kind of gets that way. Um, a few book commercials, not tonight. <clears throat> Uh, I didn't bring it up here with me, but I'm going to be speaking on the, as I've said, the, the making of the King James Bible, and there's one book left at, back there on the table on that. If you have any interest in the ministry, a book entitled The Art of Pastoring. It's used in Bible colleges across the land, and I think you can find it helpful if you have interest or you know someone in the ministry. Another book, <clears throat> it's entitled Broad is the Way, and the subtitle is Fundamentalists Merging into the Evangelical Mainstream. And that's going on all around us all the time. Churches uh, becoming more liberal. Bible colleges uh, moving to the left and becoming less fundamental. And uh, uh, it, it's a, uh, oh, a church history of the last hundred years, basically, what's going on in America. I think you'd enjoy it. And then, uh, this is the only one left here. I know some of you already have this book. Uh, Touch Not the Unclean Thing. It, it would summarize basically, or the message in Sunday school would kind of summarize what's in this book. But I want to tell you a little story about it. Uh, this actually is my doctoral dissertation, and um, they allowed me to publish it. And, uh, but anyway, so after the book had been out for a little while, I forget, I got a phone call one day, and a party on the other end who asked to remain anonymous, or not be publicly acknowledged, said that we've read your book, Touch Not the Unclean Thing, and uh, we'd like to send it all over the country. Mm. Mm. And it, they said, we have the, the, the resources to do it, and the, uh, the mail list to do it. And, uh, and so, I, so I said, okay. And the day came in October of 2001, right after 9-11, when a 53-foot semi backed up to the freight dock at the post office at the Duluth, Minnesota, uh, the post office in Duluth, and it was filled from front to back with these books, all addressed, you know, ready to go in the mail, all sorted on pallets or, you know, as, as postal regulations require. And they paid the freight, they paid the printing, they paid the, 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 uh, the postage, and, and the whole shoot and match. Uh, it was about 25,000 books, I think. Well, there were unhappy campers across the fruited plain. <laughs> And my phone started to ring. The one stipulation they had is that, that they said, we don't want our fingerprints on it. You put yours on it. So our, you know, my name, address, phone number, address, all that stuff, email addresses, all here on here. And uh, the telephone began to ring. And there were unhappy preachers. Uh, in fact, one preacher out in California called me up and challenged me to a fight. He was so upset. And uh, of course, I don't have to tell you what university they were affiliated with, my brother. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so the dust settled down on that. <coughs> Pray for me, I'm not out of the woods on this throat thing yet. But uh, anyway, about a year later, I'd gone to the Sword of the Lord conference down in North Carolina and drove home, and I didn't have a cell phone at that time. And uh, my, when I got home, my wife said, there's a guy trying to get a hold of you, and he wants to talk to you now. <laughs> oh boy, I thought, here we go again. So I dialed the number, and it was down in uh, Palm Beach, Florida, you know, right near Mar-a-Lago, you know, that kind of real estate. And uh, on the other end was this high-pitched tenor voice, elderly man, found out he was 93 years old, and he said, our friend your book, Touch Not the Unclean Thing, and I want to help you advertise it. Oh. He said, let me tell you about myself. He said, I am a man of means. Mm. He said, I'm the founder of Napa Auto Parts. <laughs> really? His name was Robert Turner. He was retired. He was 93 years old. And, and across the course of life, he, he had remarried, and his second wife drug him to church and got saved. And, uh, and became you know, a strong proponent of the King James Bible along the way. So w without going into all the story, he, he agreed to, in fact, he said, when I do business with somebody, when I do business, I, want to, I do it face to face. So I said, I'm going to fly you down here to, to, to Florida, which he did, down to Palm Beach, West Palm, flew into West Palm, and, and uh, 
uh, didn't have GPS back then, but had directions, went, and here's this very swank senior high-rise building, and he lived in the penthouse on the top floor. <clears throat> I walk in the front door, and uh, immediately I'm accosted by this butler type, please state your business. <laughs> and I said, I'm here to see Mr. Turner. Does he know you're coming? I said, yes, I have an appointment. Oh, step right this way. Well, I went up and talked to him, and, and what he wanted to do and, and proposed to do, and in fact did do, is pay for as many full-color, full-page, double-insertion advertisements we could put in Christian periodicals. And I won't go through the list of those who accepted it and those who rejected it, because most of them rejected it. But he, uh, he told me now, uh, you're the brains and I'm the money. You drop the ads and I'll pay for them. So I, I went home, hired a professional advertising agency, and they drew up these nice, you know, professional-looking uh, advertisements. And, uh, and he wanted to see them, so I sent them down to him. And he calls me back and says, oh, no, no, no. We need to change this, this, and this. And folks, when it was done, it looked like a Napa Auto Parts ad. <laughs> but this book has some notoriety. Uh, it's gone all over the country. All right, tonight, one verse. You need not turn there, but... Uh, Mark 1.9 says, holding forth the faithful word. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, the faithful word. Now, as we talked about this morning, there are two competing texts, the traditional received text and the modern critical text. And the, from the received text comes the King James Bible. From the critical text comes just about all the modern uh, contemporary Bibles. And there are distinctives, to, uh, the, the difference between the two texts. Verses missing, verses changed, and uh, we talked about that this morning. And that'll have some significance here in just a second. But I'd like to talk, first of all, tonight about the traditional received text. And I, I, I prefer the term traditional text for one reason, and I, I know that most uh, people of our, our camp use the word received text or textus receptus. Textus receptus is just Latin for received text. But that term was not coined until about 1633. And folks, the Word of God existed before 1633. And, uh, and so that's why I call it the traditional text, because it's a, it's a text that we can trace right back to the beginning. Without boring you with technical details, there is textual evidence of the received text or the traditional text going right back into the second and third centuries. By second century, I mean like 125 AD. That's very early. Uh, and they weren't complete New Testaments, but there would be a, a copy of the Gospel of John or a part of the, a part of, the Gospel of John. And they, are, they follow the distinctives of the received text. Well, it, it doesn't take a lot of logic to figure out that if they follow the received text, they were copied from the received text. Mm, and it, it just simply verifies the, the antiquity or the, 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 the veracity of the, the traditional received text. Just for your information, it's called the Bodmer Papyri and the Chester Beatty Papyri. I know that, that greatly edified you when you heard that. <laughs> but, but not only that, uh, early church leaders, early church fathers quoted uh, from portions that, that pertain to the, uh, the, the received text. Men such as Irenaeus and Tertullian and Cyprian and Ignatius and Hippolytus, again, in the second century. And it just simply says that the traditional text was the working text of the New Testament even in the earliest days of Christianity because that it, it is the New Testament. It is the Word of God. Amen. Well, as we talked about this morning, then the Lord put it on the heart of some to start translating uh, the, the New Testament in Greek into the, the common languages, vernacular languages, the everyday languages. And uh, in the year 150 AD, the church at Antioch, you recall that uh, the Apostle Paul uh, was, was part of that church. It was his sending church uh, as, uh, for he as a missionary, uh, for him as a missionary. And in 150 AD, the, the, the churches of Syria, headed by the church at Antioch, produced a, a translation of the New Testament called the Peshitta translation. Peshitta in Syrian was just meant the, the basic uh, translation. And what was... Uh, unique or, or, or unusual or interesting, perhaps, is the word, is that it just simply follows the, the traditional text. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that if a translation follows the received text, it was translated from the received text. 
and the, the, it, it is there in the earliest days. Uh, in, in the year 157, uh, churches in northern Italy called the Italic churches. They had nothing to do with the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church wasn't invented until about 350 AD. And don't let anyone ever, let anyone ever tell you that the, the, the Roman Church is the mother church. It is not. The Church of Jerusalem was the mother church. Amen. And uh, as trouble came and problems came, then many of them migrated up to Antioch. But in 157, churches in northern Italy, uh, Italic churches, and some of them claimed they were started by the Apostle Paul, uh, produced a translation of the New Testament in Old Latin, and it was called the Italic Version. Uh, and again, it follows the traditional text. Uh, in fact, the, the Italic churches uh, were the lineal forerunners of the later Waldenses as we get down to around the year 1000 AD and so forth. And, uh, and they, of course, were essentially uh, independent Baptists by their doctrine and their position. In the year 350 A.D., a missionary uh, on the field in southeastern Europe to the Gothic tribes, a man by the name of Ufolus, uh, produced a translation of, of the New Testament. And it was, to this day, is called the Gothic translation. It still exists at a university in Sweden in their library. Uh, but it also follows the traditional text. And uh, what that all says is that this is the Word of God. Amen. The earliest brethren, and there are other translations, but these are those of which we have particular record. And it goes right back to the earliest days. These were Bible-believing, born-again people that were essentially of, of the same doctrinal position uh, that this church would take. Well, moving forward now, as you recall in history, the, the, the Europe moved into the Dark Ages, but uh, in the year 1453, Muslims conquered Constantinople and, 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 and called it Istanbul uh, to this day. And it's, it's, but Constantinople had been the, the headquarters of the Eastern Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, Greek Church, and when, when they perceived the Muslims were coming, uh, many of the church leaders fled up into Central Europe and they took their precious manuscripts with them. And, and now in Europe, Central Europe, are, are numerous copies, manuscripts of the traditional text. And as we touched on this morning, a man by the name of Erasmus, a Dutch scholar, uh, began to study the Greek New Testament uh, he lived in several places uh, in, in Europe, from England to, to Switzerland to Holland. But in studying the New Testament, Erasmus got saved. And as I mentioned this morning, Erasmus, uh, his, his particular significance is that he put the manuscripts of the traditional text into printed form. And it became known as the Erasmus text. And uh, again, it's, it's the, just the New Testament. It's the Word of God. But he printed it and began to mass produce it, uh, first beginning in the year 1516. Uh, and uh, over the years, he, he did uh, four more editions. And, and the editions basically were to either A, correct typographical errors and letterpress printing of that era. The technology was such that typos were a, a very common and, and easily made. Uh, he wasn't changing the text other than between his first and second edition, and I won't go into all that now, it's in the book back there if you want to read about it. Uh, but he printed the New Testament. And now it's being published by the thousands there in Central Europe. Well, he died, Oh, and I think I made the mention this morning, I'll say it again, uh, over those years he basically became a Baptist. And he was in direct fellowship and, and communication with the Anabaptists there in, in Switzerland and Southern Europe. And folks, you put a, a person on a desert island and all he has is, is the, 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 the Bible, he'll come off that island someday being a Baptist. <laughs> uh, because that's what Baptists are. We just take the book at face value. Amen. And so Erasmus died. And, and by the way, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a lineage. I don't expect you to remember all these names and dates. Uh, but uh, a lineage, you recall the lineage this morning was people who were apostates, liberals, heretics, people dabbling in the occult. 
uh, you're going to see a lineage here of people who are godly, people who are born again, people in the case of Erasmus became a Baptist. What a difference. Well, Erasmus died and uh, another man took up his, his work uh, in, in Paris. His name was Robert Stevens, or in Latin, Robert Stephanus. And he continued to print the New Testament in Greek. And uh, by uh, he, all these guys were Catholics to start with. But as he studied the New Testament and, and, and read all the proofs of, of, for the printing of, 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 the, of the New Testament, uh, Robert Stevens got saved. Amen. And because of the persecution of the Catholics, he was forced to flee Paris and he wound up in Geneva, Switzerland. And we're going to hear that name pop up a number of times tonight. Geneva was a place in Central Europe where the Catholics had no authority and they had no power. And you no doubt are aware of the Catholic Inquisition and their fierce persecution of Bible-believing people. They hated the Word of God. And, uh, and so many of them would flee to, to Geneva, where there was protection for them. And there in Gen uh, Geneva, Steve, uh, Stephan his, his Latin name was Stephanus. Uh, Stevens or Stephanus continued to print the New Testament. And uh, what he was particularly uh, remembered for is he was the first man to introduce chapter and verse divisions uh, to the New Testament. If you look at some of these old manuscripts, I mean, they're just line upon line upon line, and they're not you know, separated by verses as we are so accustomed today. Well, Stevens died, and another, uh, he was a printer by trade, incidentally, and another printer in Paris by the name of Theodore Beza. Uh, took up the task of printing Bibles. He likewise got saved. Amen. And he likewise was persecuted by the Catholics, and he likewise fled to Geneva, where he continued his work, and he actually did 10 editions uh, of printing the New Testament. And eventually, uh, after John Kelvin died there in, in uh, Switzerland, in, in Geneva, uh, Beza became his successor. And I might add just to this, this note, that uh, the Calvinism that we talk about today is far worse than John Calvin was. He would hardly recognize uh, the, the, the Calvinism that's, that's developed. Uh, and so when I talk about him being a Calvinist, it, it was a different ilk than it is today. Uh, the five points of Calvinism weren't even invented in, in, in Calvin's lifetime. But, but anyway, uh, Beza got saved, and from his fifth edition, uh, it was the basic working text from which the King James translators did their work. Uh, from Theodore Beza's work. But again, notice the, the lineage of people who, who read the New Testament, got saved, and then had a burden to print the New Testament and, uh, and spread it across uh, the known world of that day. Well, that leads us into England, uh, uh, again in the, the early 1500s, and one of Erasmus' Bibles found its way to a man by the name of William Tyndale. He too was a Catholic. But he began to read the, the, the New Testament, Erasmus New Testament, and guess what? He got saved. Amen. And uh, uh, he was educated. He knew Greek, uh, as, as many educated people in that day did. Very few in this day uh, do. But, uh, and he was burdened to not only translate the, the New Testament into, into modern English, uh, the, the English that, that basically we speak today, as opposed to Middle English and Old English, which you'd hardly recognize, but he, put, he, he translated the, the New Testament, and then he published it. He had to flee to Europe because the Catholics who were still in power in England were very much opposed to what he was doing. And uh, so between Holland and Belgium, he began printing. Uh, he, he translated the New Testament. He, he translated also the Pentateuch, uh, Second Chronicles and Joshua, and so just a segment of the Old Testament, and uh, he never finished it. But while in Belgium, of course, the Catholic authorities hated as, as these Bibles were being smuggled into England and then being distributed across England, and the Catholics would round up as many as they, they could find and burn them. But they hired an agent, uh, a Judas Iscariot kind of a guy, who went to Belgium pretending to be a, a, a sympathetic to um, uh, Tyndale and ingratiated himself with Tyndale to the point where Tyndale trusted him. And then he enticed Tyndale to come out of the, the place where he was working in basically in anonymity. And once he got him out in the open, the authorities pounced on him and arrested him. And uh, he truly was a, was a betrayer. 
And, uh, and Tyndale spent, uh, if, my, if my memory serves me, it was at least six months. It may have been longer. I'd have to bone up my, my memory there. But in, in, in the most wretched conditions in a, a cold, dank, dark prison in Belgium. And finally, in the year 15, uh, well, in, he, he printed his first Bible in 1523 uh, and sent them back to England. In the year 1536, uh, he was put to death by the Catholic authorities. And what they did is brought him to the stake, chained him to the stake, and then they strangled him to death, then lit the fire underneath him and burned his body. Nice guys. He was burned at the stake because he put the Bible into English and printed it. Uh, his dying words were, Lord, open the eyes of the king of England. Now, at, the, at that moment or at that time, the king of England was King Henry VIII. You know, the guy with six wives, and he killed, I think, four of his six wives. He was another nice guy. But uh, at that point, Henry VIII was still a Catholic. In the meantime, uh, he got into a fight with the Pope about the divorcing one of his one wives, and the Pope wouldn't recognize it. So he said, uh, forget you, I'll start my own church. And he pulled the, church of, uh, the churches of England out of the Roman Catholic Church and formed the, the Church of England, or the Anglican Church. And in, in spite of all that, the, the Anglican Church at that time was pretty biblical in its basic doctrine. They weren't Baptist, but they believed the basic fundamentals of the faith. But be that as it may, so Tyndale now was gone. His associate was a man by the name of Miles Coverdale. And Coverdale, uh, basically in, in, on the continent, continued his work of publishing the New Testament. And he filled in the Old Testament, uh, where Tyndale had not finished, but um, Coverdale did not know Hebrew. So he translated from Latin and German, which he did know. And, uh, and so much of the Old Testament of Coverdale's Bible was a translation of a translation, which, again, is not the best, but that's the best that he could do. And it became known as the Coverdale Bible. The New Testament was, was Tyndale's work. And uh, meanwhile, Henry had died, and his young son, uh, Edward, became the king of England when he was nine years old. He reigned till he was 15, six years. And during, and he was very friendly. He, he was a godly king and, and very possibly a born-again king. He had been tutored by godly tutors. And uh, he was very friendly now to those uh, printing Bibles. And so Coverdale came back to England. But in the meantime, little Edward died. And another uh, monarch stepped to the throne, his stepsister, Mary, who became known as... Bloody Mary. And one of the first things she did is arrest Miles Coverdale with the intent of burning him at the stake. Well, fortunately, his brother-in-law was the ambassador to Denmark, and he interceded with the queen and, and was able to get uh, Coverdale uh, out of the country, and so he did not face the, the, the stake and being burned. But before Tyndale died... Uh, a, a man by the name of John Rogers had come from England. He was a Catholic priest, and, but he'd gone to work for a British um, shipping company as their company chaplain, so to speak. And uh, they had offices there in the continent. And so while in Belgium, he met William Tyndale, another Englishman. And uh, in the course of events, William Tyndale led him to Christ. Tyndale was not only a translator and a, a, a publisher, but he was a soul winner. And so now Tyndale was dead and Coverdale had to leave. And so John Rogers uh, uh, took up the work of printing Bibles. And again, this was when uh, um, little King Edward, uh, the boy king, was on the throne. Well, he died. And, and one of the, again, the first thing that Mary did, Bloody Mary, is arrest uh, not only Coverdale, but she arrested John Rogers. He had produced what was known as the uh, the Matthew Bible, and we'll get to that in a second, but uh, she arrested him and eventually he was burned at the stake. Gave his life for putting the Bible into print in the English language. Uh, he called it the Matthew Bible because A, he was not the translator, Tyndale was, and uh, B, Tyndale had been declared a heretic by Henry and so he couldn't use his name. Uh, and so he used a pseudonym, Thomas Matthew, and I think perhaps hoping that maybe they wouldn't figure out who he really was, but they did. And uh, he was burned at the stake by Bloody Mary. Fortunately, Mary only reigned for five years until she died. 
But in the meantime, many uh, Bible-believing people in England had fled from England, pardon me, to Geneva. About 800 families, uh, uh, scholars and, and uh, pastors and uh, people who were knowledgeable and educated, and they went, went to Geneva. And while they're in Geneva in the year 1560, uh, they sat down and, and together produced what came to be known as the Geneva Bible. It was in English, even though it was done in Geneva. And by now, Mary was dead, and Elizabeth, her stepsister, Elizabeth I, now we just saw Elizabeth II get buried about a month ago, but uh, Elizabeth I had now become the queen, and I don't think Elizabeth was a born-again person, to my knowledge, but she was, quote-unquote, a Protestant, and she was sympathetic to the publishing of the Bible and, and wanted, wanted nothing to do with the Catholics and what they stood for. And, uh, but anyway, back in, in Geneva, the, the, the Geneva Bible had been printed and it was now being shipped back to England in considerable quantities. And the common people accepted it and they liked it and they, they began reading it and studying it. And it was unique. Uh, it was really the first study Bible ever produced. In the back were maps. Uh, there was often an introduction at the beginning of each biblical book, kind of giving the, the date and the location and you know, things that you see in a, a study Bible. Uh, uh, it also was the first English Bible to use Stephanus or Stephen's chapter and verse uh, 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 divisions, and uh, it had marginal notes. It was a truly a study Bible, and it was well received. However, in the marginal notes, in the footnotes, uh, the, the Geneva Bible was highly critical of the hierarchy of the Church of England. Uh, because of all their pomp and circumstance and all their regalia and, and so forth, and they wanted to see that change, and so they criticized it. Accordingly, the, the, the bishops of the, uh, of the Church of England did not like the Geneva Bible. Common people did, the, the, the big wigs didn't. And so in the year 1568, uh, the, the, the bishops of the Church of England produced their own translation, which came to be known as the Bishop's Bible. And uh, it, it was not well translated, it, it was poorly translated, it was stiff and wooden in its reading, and it was a large size and, and basically was assigned to each church in England and, and in some cases chained to the pulpit, uh, and that's where it sat and not many people read it. And, and so there was this succession of Bibles. And I think with the exception of the Bishop's Bible, in each case there was a refinement in getting things right and getting things uh, translated uh, and by the way, the Geneva Bible is the first Bible that was completely translated from the original languages into English. Not only Greek in the New Testament, Hebrew in the Old Testament. Well, seventh is still to come. Meanwhile, let's go up to Scotland. And in the year 1566, a little baby boy was born to Mary, Queen of Scots, in Scotland. His name was James Stewart. She was married to Henry Stewart, and, uh, but Mary, Queen of Scots, was a Roman Catholic. And in the course of events, and there's some, some sordid history and, and affairs and infidelity, and I don't want to go into all that here tonight, but in the course of it all, her husband, Henry Stewart, was murdered. And the... the most of the government in Scotland, the, uh, the, the princes and the, the people in high positions were, were Protestants, uh, Presbyterians, if you will, and they didn't want a Catholic monarch, and so they forced Mary, Queen of Scots, off the throne. She was forced to abdicate, and so she fled to England, and in fact, there was actually a little civil war in there where, where she lost. She fled to England, and Queen Elizabeth uh, in England was very skeptical and leery of, of, of uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, and so she placed her under house arrest. Mary had one time said she should have been the, the, the Queen of England, and so Elizabeth was, was, I could say, suspicious of her. And then it was found out that she, in fact, had been complicit in a plot to overthrow Elizabeth and, and put her on the throne. Well, that, that cooked it. I mean, she, she cooked her goose. Mary sent her to the, the, the Tower of London, and off came her head. She lost her head. Uh, she was beheaded. So this leaves the little boy up in Scotland, James, an orphan, but a royal orphan. And James, and, and he never saw his parents again. His dad was dead, and his mother 
had fled the country. And at the age of 13 months, little James Stuart became King James VI of Scotland. 13 months. And, and so the, the, the authorities there in Scotland hired several uh, 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 tutors. Um, they were called regents. And the one regent who was particularly influential on little James was a man by the name of George Buchanan. And for 13 years, from the time that James was four years old until the time he was 17 years old, George Buchanan homeschooled, tutored little James. And he taught him thoroughly in, in the classic, the basics of reading and, and arithmetic and science and history. But uh, George Buchanan was a devout Christian man himself. He was a Presbyterian, but he was a, absolutely a Bible-believing Christian, and he loved the Lord. And he was determined to train little James to be a godly man. And he did. But he not only trained little James in uh, the basics of education, but he trained him thoroughly in Bible. And taught him theology. He taught him how to read and write biblical Greek. Taught him how to read and write biblical Hebrew. In fact, at some point in James' life, he actually did some, his own personal translating just for his own edification. It, it, it had nothing to do with the later King James Bible. And when James was 17, he became the king of England, or Scotland, I'm sorry, altogether. But he was a unique king. Uh, every Sunday, he would go to church on Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon. They didn't have evening services then like we do now. They had afternoon services. He was there twice a day, uh, every Sunday. Uh, James also uh, organized a, a, a royal chapel system, whereby he brought in Bible-believing preachers to preach to him and his court several times a week at chapel services. So that his, his uh, administration, his associates, his uh, cabinet, I guess we'd use in modern terminology, were hearing the word of God. He had memorized large segments of the Bible. Some say he knew the whole Bible by heart. I don't think that's probably true, but he had large segments he had personally memorized. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The Catholics accused him of being a homosexual, part of their nasty smear campaign. Uh, but the fact is James was married and had six children. And uh, he produced a book for his son, uh, 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 Prince Henry, who later died, and then his next son was Charles, who would eventually be, become his successor. But he, he, he published a little book, or had a little book made up for his son. Uh, it was entitled Basilicon Doron, which basically means a royal gift. And in that book, uh, James, line by line, described how a king ought to deport himself as a godly king, how to be a godly king, and how to rule justly and righteously as a godly king. Kind of like the book of Proverbs, where Proverbs, uh, Solomon wrote to my son, my son, my son. Uh, James did that for his son, and it actually turned out to be his second son. He actually used it. Uh, but I say all of that to say this. <coughs> 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 Stuff is running out, brother. <laughs> he was a godly man. Now, I'm going to say something here. This is from the book of Sorensen. It's not from the Word of God. But in my opinion, James Stuart, King James VI of Scotland, later of England, was the most godly king since Josiah in Second Chronicles. There certainly weren't any godly Jewish kings after Josiah. And I don't know of any Gentile kings that had the godly character that James had. And God used the unfortunate circumstances when he was just a little boy of losing his parents, I believe, in preparing him for a great task that was laid ahead. Well, let's go back to England. England had switched from being a Catholic nation to a Protestant nation. But folks, it did not go smoothly. It did not go happily. 
And uh, there were plots and conspiracies and counterplots and assassination attempts. Let me tell you about one little incident that, that took place right after James became king of England, but it, 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 it shows the, 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 the political and religious climate, which would have some bearing upon uh, James when he came to England. Uh, in the year 1605, uh, a Jesuit operative, as you know, the Jesuits were the shock troops of the Vatican, a Jesuit operative in England, a, a guy by the name of, a man, I should say, by the name of Guy Fox. Uh, F-A-W-K-E-S, uh, in cahoots and collusion with quite a few Catholics in England. It was not a small conspiracy. Uh, it was, they, they planned this, this, this amazing plot. And what they did is they rented the building next to the, the British Parliament building. And at night, they would tunnel uh, a, a burrow between the two buildings until there, there was an opening big enough that they could go through and, 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 and haul stuff back and forth. And uh, they assembled 36 barrels of gunpowder and, and assembled all that gunpowder in the basement of the parliament. And the plan was when the parliament and the king presiding was in session, they'd blow the whole place up. Kill the king and the parliament, which were, were, were Protestants, and in so doing, they would then take over the country. And there were people around the country ready to rise up when that happened. Well, they made the mistake of putting this all in writing, and, and one of those documents made it into the hands of, of the authorities, and they caught uh, Fox in the basement uh, at, at the last minute with matches in his pocket ready to light the fuses. He was going to light the fuse, jump in a boat, and row across the Thames River. Uh, and, and, and that illustrates the, the intrigue and what was going on in England, as we're going to see here in just a second. Well, anyway, so Fox was arrested, and he was sentenced to die by being drawn and quartered. I don't know if you know what that means, but they, they would drag a man behind a horse uh, on just a, uh, just a slight frame and bounce him down the streets, and they got to the place of execution, hang him, and then after they're done, they'd chop his body up into four pieces. They quartered him. They didn't mess around. And, uh, well, anyway, so in the year 1603, in, in March of 1603, Queen Elizabeth I was gravely ill, and she died. But before she died, and, and I don't fully understand all the, the protocols of English succession, but the, she, Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, uh, was not married and had no children, and so it was her prerogative to choose her successor. And guess who she chose? Her cousin, James, up in Scotland. And, uh, and he, was a, he was appointed to be the next king of England. And so James, and he knew it was coming. There had been communications going back and forth. And so it wasn't a surprise to him when it came to pass. But he, he packed up his family, and they traveled the 400 miles from uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, to uh, uh, London. Took him 30 days to do so. <coughs> Time out. But as they approached, as the royal carriage approached Jerusalem, not Jerusalem, what's the stuff I've been drinking? <laughs> as they approach London, suddenly the road is blocked by horsemen. And James had a few guards with him, and they didn't know what was going on, and they sprang to a defensive position. But the leader of the horsemen put his hand up and said, Sire, we come in peace. His name was John Reynolds, and he was the leader of the Puritan movement in England. The Puritans had developed during the time of Elizabeth, and actually prior to that, going back to uh, Mary, they were not Baptists, but they basically were the fundamentalists of their day. They were Bible believers. And uh, they loved the Lord, and they preached the Word of God. They didn't uh, practice baptism by immersion, unfortunately, but they, they, they were very conservative doctrinally. And Reynolds uh, delivered to the king a petition signed by 1,000 Puritan preachers. It was called the Millinery Petition, Millinery referring to 1,000. And in that petition, they, they petitioned the king to make some changes in the Church of England, uh, and to authorize a new translation of the Bible. Hmm, interesting. 
James agreed to hear their grievances, their complaints. In the meantime, the Black Plague came through and kind of shut the country down for several months, six months, kind of like COVID did here. And so the, the meeting did not take place until January of 1604. And they met at the Hampton Court Palace, which is just north of London, a very elaborate palace, had a thousand rooms in it. But on the one side were the, was the bishops headed up by Richard Bancroft, and the other side were the Puritans headed up by John uh, Reynolds, and, and presiding was King James I. He was now King James I. He had been King James VI of England, uh, but the first of England. Sixth of Scotland and the first of England. I get you confused here. And the king heard the, the petitions and the, the, the grievances and the request of the Puritans to, to do away with some of the pomp and circumstance and all the regalia and all the, the I mean, you saw in the, 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 the funeral of Elizabeth, all the, the, the highfalutin stuff. They just wanted to go back to simple, you know, wearing ordinary clothes and have a simple building without uh, all the, uh, the trappings that you see in a, a, a high church kind of a situation. And James, as new king, didn't want to rock the boat, and he basically said no. But when uh, Reynolds said, sire, we'd also petition thee to authorize a new translation of the Bible. Guess what he said? Yes. <laughs> yes. And there, there's more of the backstory there. I'm not, I don't have time. I won't go into all that here tonight. And so in the next several months, James, uh, through uh, Richard Bancroft, appointed 52 translators, of which only 47 worked. Uh, some of them died and some of them were in poor health. They were organized into six companies. We'd call them committees today, I think. But uh, two companies met at Westminster Abbey, two companies met at Oxford University, and two companies met at uh, Cambridge University. And each of those companies or committee, uh, committees were given what, what amounted to one-sixth of the Bible to translate. And uh, they, they worked from Theodore Beza as the base text uh, of, of the received text, the traditional text. And uh, uh, started their work. They referenced the uh, Reign of Valera, which was a, another received text Bible, and Luther's Bible as, as reference points. And uh, they would cross-check their work. As each translator translated his assigned portion, he would then trade it with another party on the committee, and they would go over each other's work. And, and, and the, the, each committee did this. I mean, we're talking about this took years. Uh, and then when each of those six companies or committees had, to their satisfaction, done their work to the very best of their ability and thought, thought they had it absolutely right, then they would trade with one of the other committees and they'd go over each other's work. This went on for five years of translating and cross-checking and double-checking and making sure they got it right. And by the way, they did. And finally, it was sent to uh, a, an executive committee who in 1610 then presented it to the royal printer. We'll get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. But I want to tell you a little bit about the translators. They have been accused of, of being low-brow and, and low-class and, and uh, uh, rowdy and bowdy kind of people. That is not the truth. They were godly men. Uh, they were Bible believers. Some of them were pastors. Some of them were, had been missionaries. Some of them were, were evangelists. Some of them taught in Bible colleges there in England. And they were godly men. Not only that, they were probably the most brilliant group of, of linguists uh, insofar as uh, English and, and the biblical language that's, that's ever been assembled. Some of those men knew Hebrew when they were six years old. Some of those men were, were fluent in ten languages. Some of those men were called a walking university because they had so much knowledge between their ears. Uh, brilliant men. And they spent basically five years in translating the Word of God. And as I've said earlier, they, uh, as it turns out, about 85% of the, the New Testament was, in fact, the work of William Tyndale. Now, Tyndale got it right in the first place, for the most part. And they used his work. And so today, 85% of your King James Bible is, is, the, is, is the result of the labors 
of the, the martyr William Tyndale. But brilliant men. Now, just to, to pause for just a second to, to ask, and, and this comes up from time to time, is the King James Bible as a translation inspired? And the answer to that is no, no translation is inspired. We talked about this morning how that uh, inspiration is a God-spoken book. God spoke through David and Isaiah and Paul and John and James and, and uh, Moses and Jeremiah and so forth. I don't think he spoke the same way to John Reynolds or John Boys or Lancelot Andrews or Henry Saravia. You say, who are they? They were some of the translators. But I believe God providentially helped them and guided them. And that the translation was, was, was accurate and correct. And as I said this morning, don't let anybody tell you there are mistakes in the King James Bible because I've yet to see one. And I've read the, the, the King James Bible through over 300 times. Yeah. And so the, the work was sent to Robert Barker, the, who was the royal printer. Uh, and in England to this day, the crown holds the patent on the King James Bible. That, that it would be analogous or equivalent to a copyright here in America. In America, the King James Bible is not copyrighted. Now, a, a study Bible, uh, you, you, uh, I said that once, and one of the kids in a youth group came in and showed me the, his Bible. It says here, it says the copyright. Well, I was talking about the notes in the Thompson Chain Reference Bible are copyrighted, but, but not the text. But, but anyway, Robert Barker... Uh, was given the task, and, and they wanted him to print 20,000 copies. Now, this is not on you know, high-speed uh, printing presses like we know today. It's letterpress printing, where uh, if you've ever seen pictures or uh, illustrations of a letterpress printer, uh, each page is put in there, and they, they screw the, the thing down tight and, and back up again, and then another page, and it was page by page by page. It was, it was tedious work. But they wanted 20,000 copies, and uh, so Barker enlisted several other printers in London, subcontracted to them to help him in the project, and the result is that some of the early editions were not all the same because there are typographical errors, mistakes. And uh, uh, there is, for example, in the Book of Ruth, uh, the He Bible and the She Bible, where it talks about, uh, oh goodness, uh, Ruth's husband, I'm trying to think of his name, Boaz went into the city, or Ruth went into the city. And uh, so there was controversy on that. And, uh, but there were typos. And, and so finally, uh, in the year 1760, this is about 150 years later, uh, the Church of England authorized a, a man by the name of Francis Paris to uh, go back and, and just go through and make sure everything is standardized. He standardized the spelling. There were 47 translators, and folks, they didn't all spell the same. English was still not completely standardized. He standardized the spelling. He standardized the, uh, uh, the punctuation. And uh, he died and, and, and hadn't quite finished the work. And another man by the name of Benjamin Blaney uh, completed his work. And between Paris and Blaney, they did make a few changes in the words to which they thought were, were, were better, a better choice. But the, the Bible in your hand tonight is a 1769 edition. And we make a, you know, a great deal about 1611, but, but that's when it first was published. But today, the standard King James Bible is a 1769 edition. But as I said this morning, over 6 billion have been printed. That's more than any other translation. That's more than all the rest put together. And the hand of God has clearly been upon the King James Bible. Somebody asked me this morning, well, what about the new King James Bible? It purports and claims to be based on the received text. And I think they started with the received text. But if you look at a new King James Bible in the margin, uh, in, in the, uh, the center, center margin there, uh, it, it's, it's peppered with, uh, it'll say, you know, the, the verse will have a little, uh, you know, annotation out to the margin. You look there, it says N-U. And it's peppered with N-U, N-U, N-U. You say, what in the world is N-U? Well, if you recall this morning, we talked about the Nessel Alon text. That is N. And the UBS text, United Bible Society text, that, that is the U. And the N-U is just another acronym for the critical text. And the, the New King James Bible 
has either gone back to the critical text or at the least is referring the, the, the student to the critical text. And in my view, it's a Bible that's been influenced by the critical text, and to that degree, it's an adulterated Bible. I do not recommend the New King James Bible. Uh, you just stay with the old King James folks. Amen. It's the Word of God. And so, as, as I said uh, this morning, these Bibles contain the Word of God. John 3.16 3, is there, and uh, Romans 10.13 is there. But the King James Bible is the Word of God. Study it, read it, memorize it, use it in your soul winning, and don't let someone tell you it's too hard to understand. Uh, I had a nephew get saved this summer from a Catholic background. I mean, he's devouring the King James Bible. I mean, I, I told the pastor about a, 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 a felon who, a fellow who was a felon, by the way, got saved here some years ago. He's now in our church. And... Uh, uh, he uses the King James Bible. He's never had a problem with it. We've used it with bus kids over the years. They don't have a problem with it. But this, all this business, well, it's so hard to understand. That is just marketing baloney. Yeah. Trying to get you to buy an easier to read Bible. And folks, there is big money in these Bibles. The NIV has sold over 500 million copies. That's not anywhere near 6 billion. 500 million, and the Zondervan Corporation, who is the publisher of the NIV, has made untold uh, billions of dollars in profits. And other publishers have seen the same thing, and they've rushed to, to, to bring out a translation because gullible Americans will rush out and buy what they think is the newest and best edition of the Bible. The Bible doesn't change, folks. Uh, you have it in your hands, the preserved Amen. Word of God. Amen. Use it, read it, study it. All right, uh, the, the pastor mentioned about uh, some questions and answers, and uh, I, I got a couple of questions, but none of them pertain to the issues. I mean, we've talked about here. They're just some basic, you know, Bible knowledge questions, and uh, let me see if I can find one of them here. It's it was sent to me on the phone. I'll just answer one of them. What is the difference between prayer and supplication? Well, that's a good question. In the New Testament, you'll read about prayer and supplication. The word prayer, uh, without going into the Greek here, but it basically has the idea of, of addressing God, uh, of, of, of praising Him, of thanking Him, of, of, of coming to Him in, in, in worship. Supplication has the idea of making requests. Dear Lord, please take care of this or fix this or send that or, or help me or whatever. That is supplication. So they both are together. We need to praise the Lord and thank the Lord. Uh, in our prayer life, but then we ought to ask the Lord. You have not because you ask not. All right, uh, like I say, the others really did not pertain to um, anything to do with the text, so I'm, I'm just not going to go down that path tonight. But folks, it's been a blessing to be with you. This has been a lecture tonight. It's not been a sermon. I don't know what the pastor is going to do at the end here, but uh, uh, the Lord bless you, and uh, it's been just a, great to be here with you tonight.